अशोक सर क्या नाम सर एग्जैक्टली फाइव थर्टी या फाइन यू कैन गो एड थैंक्स श्रीरंजनी यू कैन स्टार्ट ना यस गुड इवनिंग वन एंड ऑल hope everyone is due safe during this pandemic i am shri ranjni a final year bcom student of sheshadripuram evening degree college welcome to 42nd international webinar of sheshadripuram evening degree college at the outset i am happy to inform you all that our evening degree college is celebrating its golden jubilee year on behalf of our college we congratulate all the stakeholders Today's webinar is fully hosted by the students of Shishadripuram Evening Degree College. I request everyone to kindly pardon us in case of any mistakes. Department of English, in association with the University of Utah (US) and the National University of Distance Education (Madrid, Spain), is organizing international webinar on digital humanities session nine. Now, I request Vinay Sagar, LS Sir. Department of Commerce to play a small video of our college. Over to you, sir. A great journey begins with a small step. Proving this statement true, it all began in 1930 when two women, educational enthusiasts, took up a noble initiative in the erstwhile posh locality of Sheshadripuram. Shrimati Anandamma and Shrimati Sitamma started a primary school with 20 children. Now, Shishadripuram Educational Trust, under its umbrella, has 36 institutions. It all began with the educational visionary Shri K M Nanjappa, the then president of Shishadripuram Educational Trust, in 1971, which has been a landmark in the history of education. for the working students by starting Sheshadripuram Evening College our college started with the primary objective of imparting formal education to the quality and needy the college is affiliated to the Bengaluru Central University being in the heart of the city it has an easy reach and connectivity its premises comprise of spacious building with good canteen computerized library business lab browsing center wifi facility sports club thus well equipped for all academic sports co curricular like nss ncc yrc etc and extra curricular activities throughout the year the college organizes orientation program for freshers and guest lecturers to equip them As most of us are working in the morning and studying in an evening degree college, it is very facilitative for us to excel in our jobs. Even though we are studying in an evening degree college, we are being provided many state level and national level opportunities to express our talents. Also, many cultural activities are being conducted. SEDC is engaged in various cultural activities throughout the year. There are numerous committees in the college that perform variedly on their behalf and have a lasting effect on the college students as well as outsiders. Our evening degree college believes in the vision to ignite the minds of every student to identify and develop their inner strength with the mission to promote holistic development of students by offering quality education and making them self-reliant and progressive. Our college NCC cadets will visit every academic year in officers training academy in Chennai the INS Kadamba Naval Base at Karwar it will motivate our college NCC cadets to join Indian Armed Forces Fight for God fight God Thank you Vinay sir Now I request Prerna as third Bcom to welcome and introduce all the dignitaries to this international webinar. Over to you, Prerna. Happy evening to India. Happy morning to United States, and a very good afternoon to Spain. I take this opportunity to welcome you all for this forty-second international webinar of our college. At the outset, I would like to thank all the office bearers of this great institution and welcome all of them. Now I would like to introduce and welcome today's first theme speaker Dr Elizabeth Ann Swanstrom 
Associate Professor, English, the University of Utah, US. Lisa Sonstrom is the author of Animal, Vegetable, Digital, Experiments in New Media Aesthetics and Environmental Poetics, a co-editor of Science Fiction Studies and the Electronic Book Review, and an Associate Professor of English at the University of Utah. Her research and teaching interests include science fiction, natural history, media theory, and the digital humanities. She was recently a Greenhouse Fellow at the University of Stavanger in Norway and a participant in the Finnish Biotech Society's Field Notes, Ecology of the Senses at the Kilpizarvi Biological Research Station in Lapland. Before joining the English department at the U, Professor Swanstrom was an assistant professor of English in Florida Atlantic University, a postdoctoral research fellow at Umeå University's HUM Lab in Northern Sweden, and the Florence Levy K. Fellow in the Digital Humanities in the English department at Brandes University in Massachusetts. She earned her PhD in Comparative Literature at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Ma'am, on behalf of Shishadripuram Educational Trust, I welcome you to this webinar. Today's second theme speaker, Dr. Salvador Ross, Associate Professor, School of Computer Science, Spanish Distance University, Madrid, Spain, is unable to join us to this international webinar due to medical emergency. On behalf of Shishadripuram Educational Family, we wish him a speedy recovery. It is my proud privilege to introduce and welcome one more distinguished person who is presiding in this webinar, Sri W.D. Ashok Sir, Honorary Trustee, Sheshadripuram Educational Trust, Bengaluru, India. Sir holds a master's degree in pharmacy specialized in the field of total, total parenteral nutrition. He served at the famous Al Haddon Hospital, Kuwait, for over 13 years. He is an honorary trustee of Sheshadripuram Educational Trust. Sir is the backbone for all the events conducted in our evening degree college. Sir, on behalf of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College, I welcome you and request you to preside you to this webinar. I would also like to welcome our beloved principal, Professor N. S. Sati Sir, who is the man of perfection and the guiding force for organizing 41 international webinars conducted so far. On behalf of our English department, I welcome you, sir. I welcome all the office bearers and trustees of Sheshadripuram Educational Trust and all the principals of our sister institutions, other heads of the institutions, conveners, volunteers, and all participants who have registered across the globe. Now, I welcome Dharapu Kunnur Sir, Program Coordinator, and Rajat B.S. Sir, IQAC Coordinator. And finally, I welcome our own teaching and administrative staff to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Prerna, for welcoming all. May I now request theme speaker, Dr. Elizabeth M. Swanstrom, Associate Professor, English, the University of Utah, US, to enlighten us on the topic of digital and natural ecologies. Over to you, Madam. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to this seminar. I'm extremely grateful and honored to be here, and I look forward to a continuing conversation after this event. I'd also like to say that um, just in case there are any technological glitches, I'm happy to provide a transcript um, of my talk. I would especially like to thank Professor Connor and everyone at Shashadripuram Evening College for your hospitality and generosity. Um, once again, I'm very honored to be here. The topic of my talk is natural and digital ecologies, but I'm going to focus on a project that will be coming out next month from DFK in Paris, which is a uh, web-based application that plays with John Ruskin's concept of the pathetic fallacy in a humorous and playful, even silly manner. I thought, however, before I begin, I would talk a little bit about my own research path. When I was a graduate student at the University of California, I became swiftly obsessed with media theory. I was excited by what such theories could do, their capacity to shed light on how, why, and what we communicate. 
My education gave me a better understanding of the entwined histories of science, religion, and natural philosophy, but it also helped me clarify my own philosophical position. I was trained in the classics, but I am a materialist through and through. And the most valuable lesson I've learned from the transhistoric study of mediation is this. Even in Plato, it is impossible to separate communication from the natural environment within which it is embedded. Digital technology is no exception. As new as it seems, the rhetoric around it has a prehistory that stretches back to antiquity. And it was during my final year of graduate school that my classical training served me especially well as the digital humanities was coalescing into a recognizable and exciting field of inquiry. But it was also in my last year of graduate school that I started to notice an unfortunate trend in new media studies. This is the tendency towards techno fetishism. Wrapped up in the novel. Yes. Uh, we, we are not able to see your PPT, man. It's a white uh, blank sheet is coming. Let's see here. You can't see my screen? Yes, screen is there, but it's blank. Oh, no. Okay. Let me try to start over. How about now? Yes, ma'am. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, no, we can. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad. Were you able to see anything before? Uh, we couldn't see anything. OK. <laughs> Let me just very quickly show you then. Um, let's see here. OK. So just want to make sure that these slides are visible. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. So wrapped up in the novelty of this new technology, many people who were writing about it at the time were treating it as some kind of ephemeral or transcendent set of practices, as with Michael Heim's really important and interesting but problematic uh, book, The Metaphysics of Virtual Reality. And that things would take this turn was surprising to me given my training in science and technology studies. It was especially problematic to read this rhetoric in the face of the growing technological detritus that was piling up globally as a result of planned obsolescence. The natural environment and the digital one, it seemed, were not merely incompatible, they were downright adversarial. What was missing from this discussion to me seemed to be the fact that both the digital and the natural are unequivocally material. And it seemed to me that artistic practice, aesthetics, art, things we enjoy, would be an important way to bridge this divide. But I wasn't seeing any artworks at this time that would do the job. They were too serious, too abstract. There was no humor in them. But it was soon after starting my first job that I learned about a project that would help me change my research focus. I had been preparing a lecture for a class when I found the following on a technology focused website. Meet Midori-san, the, the blogging plant. In a restaurant in Japan, a plant named Honorable Green was running its own blog. The sweetheart plant was hooked up to sensors that recorded the levels of light and moisture it received throughout the day. And an algorithm translated this information into complete sentences in Japanese that included that indicated the plant's emotional state of mind. After a long day of satisfying chloroplast creation, Midori-san would reflect upon her experience. Today was a sunny day. I was able to sunbathe a lot. I had quite a bit of fun today. This was exactly what I had been looking for. A project that used digital technology to link human and non-human uh, experiences in a way that would help us reframe conversations about digital and environmental practices. It was fun, playful, and accessible. Even today, when I think about that plant, it makes me laugh. This project, and a few others like it, 
provided the inspiration for my book. The talking plan also helped clarify what I now know to be my primary research objective, to reframe both technological and environmental discourse through innovative, playful, fun, even ridiculous aesthetics. It was satisfying to see my book in print, but the question of practice was something it did not sufficiently address. In other words, if I am committed to the notion that aesthetics can reframe environmental ethics, then I want my work to speak to that in its form, function, and effect, not merely in terms of its analytic content. At the same time, I have become frustrated by a tendency in digital humanities uh, to make data dumps, often in the form of decontextualized visual abstractions that are very hard to make sense of, such as these. And I am curious about other forms of modeling and visualizing literary works. The project I will share with you today is attendant to these goals. Coding literary ecologies builds from animal vegetable digital by providing more direct interaction than my book could accommodate. The project is comprised of four web-based applications, each of which makes use of natural language processing tools to help complicate traditional literary analysis. At the same time, however, it attempts to provide literary models that are more accessible, more dependent upon context, and more fun than the typical data visualization. Natural language is messy, contradictory, and powerful. Natural language processing allows us to provide structure to this unstructured mess. Before demonstrating one of my applications, I wanna talk a little bit about what these types of tools are good at doing, what they are bad at doing, and how using them in ways they were not designed to be used can be both fun and challenging. On a personal level, NLTK, um, a library that I use with uh, Python for uh, text analysis, has allowed me to cheat at the game word scrape, a simple script, will uh, take all the letters of that game and output all the combinations at its disposal. But it's also more seriously fantastic for searching for text files. It can find keywords in context, identify concordances, identify parts of speech, and much more. It's very powerful. Another useful tool that I make use of frequently is WordNet, which was originally conceived to be a dictionary that was organized syntactically rather I'm sorry, syntactically rather than alphabetically. How does this work? What does this mean exactly? Let's, let's take a look. Let's say I access WordNet and I'm interested in finding out more information about snails, the uh, kind of strange garden pest that we're all familiar with. What WordNet returns to me is really interesting. It's a list of syntactic relationships to the word snail. And this is uh, indeed a lot more exciting than a, a dictionary, simple alphabetic organizational structure. However, it has a different set of limitations than a dictionary has. WordNet does not contain syntagmatic relations. That is, the relationship is completely linguistic rather than associative. What this means is that you're only going to get one through line of any word you investigate. So here is a structure of a word net. If we want to look at where our little friend of the snail is located in this cluster, we're going to have to do so in a very strict manner. We're going to have to go up or down from general to specific, specific to general, following a very vertical, very linear path that's dependent upon, um, again, linguistic syntactic structure rather than associative structures. This is extremely useful. If you're interested in literal and taxonomic sets of relationships, WordNet is wonderful. But what do we miss when we rely exclusively on such a structure? Well, we miss the richness and wackiness and downright kooky nature of natural language of puns, neologisms, metaphors, symbolism, and so on. And to use another example, the cat, the absurd abundance of, word, of words about cats cannot be contained, even by people who are passionately devoted to creating a taxonomy of such a vocabulary. 
As soon as one taxonomy solidifies, more data enters the equation. It is impossible to keep up. And this is not to say that social networks do not value taxonomic rigor. Consider, for example, that this featured picture of the Pulmonata group on Wikipedia, while visually appealing, did not satisfy the group's strict taxonomic standards. Why not? Because the picture speaks to an ecological grouping rather than to a specific entity. In normal usage, this would be perfectly acceptable, but in the context of classification, it's problematic. This is entirely consistent with WordNet's organizing structure. WordNet contains no relations that indicate the words shared membership in a topic of discourse. For example, WordNet does not link the words racket, ball, and net in a way that shows that these words are a part of another concept, a court game. But even that concept, court game, is entirely dependent upon context. We could easily imagine a court game as a reference to um, courtly intrigue um, in a, uh, a novel or a show about um, an aristocratic um, family. What I hope these humorous instances highlight or help highlight is this. In digital humanities research, particularly in the realm of natural language processing, the semantic subtleties of any word risk erasure by the very tools meant to study them. And this takes me to my central concern. It is not merely that linguistic models cannot capture every possible permutation of meaning. No one expects this. Rather, it is that the structures of our models preclude lateral, horizontal, and associative relations. This might seem trivial, and perhaps on the level of cats and snails it is, but we see this kind of problem in many of our digital resources. As Sophia Noble writes in Algorithms of Oppression, Google purports to be credible, but is actually a reflection of advertising interests. WordNet is not Google. But in both cases, the structure of the tool shapes and limits the data it claims to describe. And the stakes are infinitely higher with Google. But let us return to literature. Linguistic taxonomies cannot adequately capture the inherent messiness of language. Literary language is highly associative. Let us consider, for example, Janus words, also called contronyms or auto, auto antonyms. These are words that mean both one thing and the opposite, such as sanction, dust, and seed. Even more tricky are instances of catachresis, or perhaps more accurately referred to as etymological hauntings. As St. Augustine notes, such slippages are inevitable and ubiquitous. Who does not use the word piscina? for something which neither contains fish nor was constructed for the use of fish when the word itself is derived from piscus, fish. Trivial perhaps when thinking about the fish's relation to the pool, but not so trivial when thinking about the etymology of the word virtue, which traces so readily back to notions of masculinity that not only devalue the female, but depend upon the exclusion of women for the assertion of power. This is not to say that this problem is new or unique. Indeed, in the 1940s, the Niebuhr Bush coined the idea of the Memex, a device that would allow a person to keep track of everything that he or she had read by making use of a head-mounted camera that would take pictures of every forking path. It's a playful project. And it is in this spirit that I will return now to my project. I seek a very playful aesthetics attendant to the intersections among digital and environmental ecologies that takes advantage of natural language processing technologies to make possible the ludicrous associations and unreliable taxonomies that are inherent in literary language. Until fairly recently, Literary scholarship has tended to treat the natural world as the stage upon which narrative unfolds rather than the essential precondition for existence. As Amitav Ghosh writes in The Great Derangement, 
the modern realist novel in particular, has succeeded by subordinating the environment to the background or setting, and by treating the chaotic unpredictability of naturally occurring events as aberrations to be disguised or repurposed. The crux of Gauche's argument suggests that before we can reimagine our relationship with the natural environment, we need chiefly to be able to witness it, to recognize it, and to usher it into the realm of incontrovertible visibility. Coding literary ecologies aims to do just this by bringing the environmental features of literary texts into detailed relief in a playful yet strategic manner. Its focus is on the lateral, the associative, the readings that would not come naturally to a trained uh, literary scholar. The project is comprised of four web-based applications that include the following. The not so pathetic fallacy, beasts, atmospheric pressure, and the literary field guide. This last, the literary field guide, uh, is available online and it allows you to upload any literary text. And after you do so, um, it will produce a brochure that introduces you to the flora and fauna of the text that you have submitted, all in the style of the National Park Service. Um, field guides that you would receive if you were to visit a park um, in our system here in the States. The second project, and this is the one that I'm going to demonstrate for you today, is called the Not So Pathetic Fallacy. And this will be, as I mentioned earlier, a part of the DFK, DFK Paris publication on new, myth, new media myths and experiments in the arts coming out, I believe in June. In Modern Painters, Volume 3, the British critic and art historian, John Ruskin, identified a persistent literary trope. This was the tendency of his contemporaries to ascribe human emotion, sentiment, or intent to non-human beings, particularly to features of the natural world. To this tendency, Ruskin assigned the name pathetic fallacy. Although the trope persists in contemporary expression, Ruskin's term for it has fallen out of fashion. This project contends that it deserves our renewed attention. Contemplating the rich interaction between human emotion and the surrounding natural landscape is worth our time. And if there were an efficient means of locating such moments, not only in poetry, but in any manner of written text, we might be more fully capable of probing their significance. This project provides some movement towards this capacity. The not so pathetic fallacy is an algorithm for recognizing sentiment across human and non-human registries. It is a browser-based web app that allows a user to upload any text file in order to find sentences that mix the human and the natural. The program proceeds sentence by sentence, looking for those that have words associated with sentiment on the one hand, and naturally occurring features on the other. The homepage looks like this. And once the program has analyzed the file, it does two things. Firstly, it creates a list of sentences that triangulate emotional, natural, and human moments. These sentences are then organized into more specific categories stored as lists and arranged into an index page. On the index, we see a total count of the sentences of the text. And in this case, we're going to check out uh, Ruskin's text, Modern Painters. And this is where the term pathetic fallacy comes from. We enter in the missing information in this interface. And we upload the file. And this will produce our index. So as we can see here, we have over 4,000 sentences. Um, and within this uh, number, we have uh, 27 sentences, which are triangulated. And then we have a calculation of what I'm calling sentiment density, which is the ratio of the triangulated sentences to the total number of sentences. And for Ruskin, we have a ratio of 27 to 4,080 or 0 0.0066 rounded. 
If we come, if we submit Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, a fairly contemporary work to Ruskin's, we can see some interesting points of contrast. 9,731 sentences, 24 triangulated, for a density of 0 0.0025. We can do the same with Moby Dick. And what we find when we compare them with Ruskin, who was so critical of making use of naturally motivated pathos, um, it won't surprise anyone who's actually read Ruskin. <laughs> he is the chief offender of his own fallacy. The second action the application takes is to produce a visualization of every sentence that has been triangulated. The visualization, the visualization appears as if it were an open book. The sentimental sentence um, appears on the left and the uh, image emerges on the right. And we can see here that after we submit the text, Moving through the index will show us um, the way uh, through these different versions of these sentences that have this kind of interesting connection between the environment and human emotion. So here we have from Ruskin, um, modern painters, a description of a sad gentle light of the setting sun and sad sunlight, as well as his happiness and joy in the Alps. And in this um, rendition from Jane Eyre, we see angry mountains, disconsolate or sad trees, and somber clouds. The illustrations of emotions are 18th century engravings inspired by the 17th century plates of Charles Le Brun or composed in the manner of Le Brun. In a playful and admittedly irreverent or cheeky move, the landscape images are all paintings by Ruskin. Full credits are provided for each and all images are in the public domain. The methodology for this project is perhaps a little more and less complicated than I anticipated. I lean heavily on the natural language toolkit, Python 3, making use of packages, spacey, beautiful soup. I also use regular expressions as well as the Flask micro framework, which makes it accessible on the web. And I do everything through pythonanywhere.com. The coding I initially thought that I was going to pursue ended up changing, for example, and in keeping with Ruskin's urge to complicate the subject object divide, I initially thought I would look exclusively for sentences in which the subject position was occupied by a natural object. So for example, I would get a sentence diagram or a sentence tree that would look something like this sentence from Jane Eyre. This has the complete breakdown of the sentence. And if you look at the subject verb positions and how they're occupied, we can see this is very familiar if we consider the word net images that we looked at earlier. And it catches what Ruskin was looking for. When does the subject brought is the verb. And this captures the pathetic fallacy precisely as Ruskin was criticizing it. With that said, if I were to limit the search so that it would only capture positions where the subject was a natural object, then I would miss sentences like this beautiful example from Ruskin. Thank God I have lost none of my old joy in the Alps. Here Ruskin is the subject, not the Alps, but the relationship is still maintained. This seemed to me to be a loss. If we look at this sentence from Jane Eyre, I found no pleasure in the silent trees or in the sentence that we just looked at by Ruskin, what we see in fact is that they demonstrate something else that was important to his argument. In this essay, Ruskin uh, makes uh, some really interesting claims about the power of natural objects. And so instead of limiting my search so rigidly, I decided to look for any moments of overlap in these two categories, regardless of their position in the sentence tree. So ignoring that vertical structure. 
What I found was that even though this produced a less precise instance of the type Ruskin criticized, I'm just looking for word overlaps here, it returned a much richer and more robust set of results. In Ruskin's original essay, he argues that the natural objects possess the power to provoke experience. The blue gentian, a flower, has the power to produce the effect of blueness. We perceive it, but its power is to provoke that perception. Ruskin stopped short of affirming a convincing taxonomy of their ability to provoke specific emotions. But here, sentence after sentence, we see that they do not merely provoke colors, but sensations of all kinds. In other words, Ruskin only has it half right. If one is sad, it is true. The raining sky and gray clouds do not weep in sympathy with one's plight. Invert the causal relation, however, such that it is the inclement weather that causes the sadness and the fallacy converts into a logical sequence. Put bluntly, while the rain does not care about us, we may well be effectively responding to the environment we find ourselves in, unconsciously or not, partially or not, mirroring and evoking our surroundings. This application helps us reframe this relation. In the environmental humanities, the importance of human affect or emotion has become increasingly apparent, even as its challenge to human exceptionalism remains intact. At the same time, in what is alternately called the new materialism, actor network theory, vibrant materialism, or object-oriented ontology, the importance of decentering human experience and resituating it within what Bruno Latour has labeled the parliament of things remains paramount. And yet the networks of subjectless objects of new materialism and the affect riddled human subjects of eco-criticism are not often in dialogue. The pathetic fallacy attends to both concerns. Through its displacement of human sentiment upon natural objects, it expands affective registries to include non-human actors and hence calls attention to the ecological factors that contribute to any emotional experience. In sum, coding literary ecologies foregrounds the importance of natural spaces to literary texts, as well as to our constructions of nature more broadly and the cultural imagination. The virtue and risk of its approach is its performative nature, its playfulness, yet the objective of play in this context could not be more urgent in an age of increasing ecological fragility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam, for your insightful theme address. Dr. Salvador Ross, Associate Professor, School of Computer Science, Spanish, Distance University, Madrid, Spain, the second theme speaker of today's international webinar, is unable to join us today because of medical emergency. We wish him a speedy recovery. Now, the floor is open for interaction. We will take up questions which we have received in chat box and from registration form. I request Vinay Saga sir to moderate the interaction session. Uh, very good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, the question goes like this. How do you differentiate a real ecology, literary ecology, and digital ecology? Thank you for that question. It's a fantastic question. And I think one of the problems in humanity scholarship has been that we tend to separate them so distinctly that we don't find connective um, tissue between them. <laughs> so on one hand, the answer is that, well, it's obvious the natural ecological um, environments are the ones that we interact with daily. Uh, literary ecologies are simulated uh, mimetic representations. However, I like to call attention to the fact that digital um, and representational works are themselves material. They are themselves um, coming from that same material world that uh, we interact with and we call our environment. 
So the tools that we use, Google, for example, um, has a pretty intense carbon footprint every time we make a search uh, using that engine. Um, so it's a, it's a great question. And I think that intuitively they're obviously distinct, but it's very useful to find the uh, connections between them. Thank you for your question. One more question. Uh, why are uh, syntax and semantics important in literary ecology? Uh, absolutely. And I would say that that's one of the wonderful things about natural language processing is that it's very quick. If you're looking for straightforward information, so for example, if I want to find out um, how many instances of a certain color or a certain flower occur in a text, natural language processing uh, gives me that information really instantly, much quicker than it would if I were to search on my own. Where it doesn't help as much is uh, trying to parse those semantic relations that are completely associative and dependent upon context. So if we use slang, if we use jokes, sarcasm, puns, um, things, or inside knowledge, um, our semantic tools for processing natural language are not going to catch that. Uh, we read every day about advances in machine learning and neural networks that promise uh, to achieve these results, but these promises have yet to be fulfilled. So to answer your question quickly, yes, semantics are incredibly important but they are not sufficient in terms of natural language processing to capture every permutation of meaning. Thank you for your question. Thank you, ma'am. And the last question for the day, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, what are the roles of imagination and visualization in digital and literary ecologies? Could you please repeat the question? Yes, ma'am. Um, what are the roles of imagination and visualization in digital and literary ecologies? Thank you for that question. Um, so this is something that I hope that we all as consumers and producers can answer collectively together. I think that largely visualizations uh, of literary text or any text for that matter are, are quite terrible. They're abstract, um, they're very often hard to decipher. And with the uh, irony that visualizations are meant to provide simplifications of an abundance of data. So to answer that question, I would say, that's up to us to change, I hope. I, I hope we don't have to uh, look forever at bar graphs or pie charts <laughs> or segmented columns with thousands of different data points that aren't clearly defined. And instead, we can consider more playful opportunities for visualization. And that's what I'm attempting to do in this project. But thank you for your question. Thank you so much, ma'am, for answering our questions. Uh, uh, this is all from uh, all about from back here in the session. Over to you, Shreya Anjana. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am, for answering the questions of our participants. A small announcement before presidential remarks. We will send the feedback form link now in the chat box as well as your registered mail, which will be active for the next 48 hours. Kindly fill the same and send back the e-certificate. The e-certificate will reach you from seven to 10 days. We will shortly meet in one more international webinar of our evening college that is on 7th of this month. The topic is on global standards in library science, radio frequency identification in libraries in association with Rapid Radio Solutions Private Limited, Ahmedabad, Gujarat, and Bibliotha Singapore Private Limited, Singapore. Now, I request Sri W.D. Ashok Sir, Honorary Trustee, Sheshadripuram Educational Trust, to render the presidential remarks. Over to you, sir. Good evening, one and all. From Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College, from the IQAAC Department of English, in association with University of OTA, United States of America, this international webinar from the Digital Humanities Session 9 has gone very well. And I would like to thank Dr. Elzibeth from the United States who has given a 
knowledge of digital and natural ecologies and says that the places of historical interest places are constantly changing ecology or ecosystem changes when large scale environmental degradation takes place due to human interference sustainability is important at the same time where land water comes in interactions with humans the relationship between nature and humans becomes very important and at times even comparing the data available of places from century to century becomes important at the same time because as we are seeing landscapes or the land or the environment ecosystem changes due to human interference at many of the stages as madam dr elzibeth was also stating that by the data is shared to the next generation becomes very important so that a kind of saving the nature that is ecosystems comes in the minds of the humans at the same time madam dr elzibeth has given a thorough knowledge of how the studies are being carried out in the digital humanity section in the ecology platforms and questioning becomes very important as she has said that why what how and uh, she has also referred to the digital dumping which is happening and at the same time how it has to be taken up seriously and avoid ecological destructions from this digital dumping or scraps being uh, unloaded and also she gave very nice importance for the coding of literature ecologies and the tools like world net which can be utilized in order to make the humanities in a very easier way <clears throat> dr elzibeth also stated the etymology and the natural language processing and she explained about ruskin's paintings and different uh, languages being utilized and the importance of learning python at the same time how important it becomes even during the digital age how one can keep up with the face so i just want to say that on the whole this international webinar digital humanity session 9 went very well and uh, just missing dr other speaker from madrid national university of distant education was not able to join today's webinar hope he gets well faster at the same time i would like to thank vinay sagar and rajat b s coordinators of today's webinar dara pasar hod english and at the same time i would like to thank students of uh, sheshadipuram evening degree college who have handled this webinar in a wonderful way last but not the least the most important dr professor n s satish principal who has coordinated all these sessions of international webinars until date thanking one and all for today's webinar thank you once again thank you sir for tendering with this presentation remarks now i request gautam of third bcom to render vote of thanks over to you gautam gautam गौतम आर्य जय दिखेसा Sir, I'll take. Ah, you you can talk. Okay. I think some yeah. uh, network issue is there. Sure, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, sir. Yeah. It is my proud privilege to uh, propose word of thanks on behalf of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College on this occasion. At the outset, I thank the University of Uta, US. and uh, the national university of distance education madrid spain for associating with us to conduct this international webinar i would like to express our sincere gratitude to uh, the theme speaker dr elizabeth 
associate professor university of utah us for rendering the theme talk on digital and natural ecology i am humbled and grateful to you ma'am thank you very much i would like to express our sincere thanks to dr salvador rose national university of distance education madrid spain for associating with us unfortunately he couldn't join us because of uh, the health i i uh, thank in his absence here i express our sincere thanks to sri wd ashok sir honorary trustee sheshadripuram educational trust for rendering the presidential address thank you very much sir my special thanks to our beloved young and energetic principal professor ns satish sir who is the robust of our sheshadripuram evening degree college thank you very much sir i express our gratitude to all the principals conveners and members of our sister institutions and other colleges academicians research scholars students and delegates across the globe for participating in this webinar i would like to convey our heartfelt gratitude to sheshadripuram evening degree college teaching as well as office staff well um, uh, we will ever remain grateful to all the members who have supported directly and indirectly thank you one and all thank you sir once again thank you one and all satish sir can we conclude the meeting webinar yeah so vinisha thank you the session thank you sir ma'am thank, thank you, you for thank you so much this is a pleasure thank you so thank much you, have a wonderful evening <laughs>